Okay, nice. If we, yeah, if we, don't, if we don't make it through today, we'll have another session tomorrow. So. That's fine. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, we just uh, have to make sure that it's at a reasonable time for me in San Francisco. That's. Oh, right. That yeah, might not be. Uh, hold on. Let me get into the. Uh, let me get into the meeting. I guess I killed it off. Uh, hold on. Someone's already presenting. I'm seeing uh, Armando. Yes. That's me. That's you. OK, so you, you want to run the slides? That would be great, actually. Yeah. Why don't you go do that? OK. We just have the next. Another. OK. So why don't you move uh, to the stance slide? <coughs> yeah. All right. List of issues. I can go next. You can just see all these issues. Uh, and then more issues. Um, so next slide. I don't know who made this, but that's you, Jennifer, or so is Lauren. Yeah, this is, this is us. Uh, I think I just wanted to touch upon the fact that you know the progress has been made there, uh, on the WebRTC stats implementation compared to last year. I won't harp on uh, the fact that Kite already presented a bunch of things that shows progress has been made. But uh, like clearly, if you look at the, um, the slide, uh, you see numbers increasing. Um, you can uh, look at the actual one at webrtcstats.callstats.io. That's the live version of the page. But if uh, the reason we brought it up is this one just verifies uh, if the stats are being reported on. Uh, there's an interesting thing that we were dis discussing last year, which we need to start making progress on, and that's validation, which is the next slide, I think. So just looking at this one, if I was going to say the things we need to pay the most attention to is it. What would you what would you tell us that we need to work on the most for it? I think in terms of um, implement I think the first thing we need to do is that uh, we started this process of re uh, like fixing some of these stats so things right. that were in some other places are now returning to inbound or remote inbound RTP or uh, inbound RTP local or outbound RTP. I think that changes finally been made a couple of weeks ago. And I think we're now trying to stabilize that over the next few few weeks. So we'll need extra eyes on the spec because stats have moved around in the last year. We made new dictionaries and we moved them back, partly because of simulcast, partly because of tracks. We'll come to some of those things later. I think implementation-wise, that's the place we need to work the most, like things that, uh, like the inbound and the outbound RTPs, that's uh, implementation wise, I would say that's the place you have to work in terms of specification. I think we're in a good place. I think we're now starting to work on like more interesting problems and like the, the basic metrics are quite well defined. And as people are implementing them, I think we are getting more implementation experience. I think that would be my summary. Yeah. Henrik, what do you think? None of the numbers here. It uh, looks like a lot of things are missing, but the the metrics themselves are implemented. They're just put in the wrong place. Right. So it looks like like the sender receiver and, and track and inbound and outbound RTP, all of those have uh, stuff in common. So I don't know what the true numbers are, but those those but should look better. Yeah. So it's so in many cases it's just a map. Implementation is very easy because it's just a matter of connecting something that yeah. you need this. And we're going to have bloated implementation for a while because you report both the old value and the new value. Mm -hmm. Have you assigned your scripts? I think the old values and the new values, that's interesting. I thought they were on different APIs, at least in the case of Chrome. Like promise and non-promise, no, uh, but did you mean the, like moving? The stuff we already put in a new API and have moved because of spec okay. changes. That's the one I'm thinking. Was on right. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. So the reason we called out that aspect was because I think all the stats uh, that are now being reported, we need to start to validate if the measurements are. Somewhat reasonable. Um, 
And we've not made much progress on this since last year, even though I think uh, several people volunteered to to do this, including us, and we've not found the time to actually um, put this together. So I believe that there is some community work required to, to do this. Um, so Baron, last year, if I recall correctly, you did present some results that did some semantic validation, or am I confused? Yeah, we call them verification validation. So semantic verification, I believe you mean that the repair, report a number, the number exists. Um, that's what verify does. But validate is like you add 50 milliseconds delay, and you see what delay is actually reported on the link. Like it should be reasonably close to 50, or uh, it shouldn't be outrageous like 500. I think that's okay. what we're going for. The other thing that we like, simple things like counters going up. Um, so, so when I, things I guess, happen, then the things get reset. I think those are the things that we want to validate. So your your plan is to for the simple ones to validate them in WPT, and for the other ones to use Kite or uh, manual testing. Yeah. Okay. Kite or uh, yeah, basically Kite as a harness and like some kind of uh, a network emulation test yeah. bed for uh, things that would require that kind of uh, support. Yeah. I guess for uh, the simple counters like incremental, you can, you can do that in a, in a single patch test. Uh, WPT should be fine there. Right, and I'm hoping that like we are able to build, uh, like we, I mean, the community is able to build uh, things around this so that we can at least check off some of the low-hanging fruits either through WPT tests or some other uh, mechanism. So I know that we have some very limited uh, value validations in uh, WebKit tests that we could upload uh, upstream to WPT. I wonder whether, uh, Mozilla or Chrome, you also have like similar tests that would be easily uh, test certain <coughs> bad, uh, on the integration level. Like there's very, there's low, Mm -hmm. No uh, uh, unit tests for the, but on a peer connection level, the unit tests or the tests we have are like, is there a number present? Okay, right. you right. Okay, yeah. the right number. Okay. I have like some basic tests like, uh, is it incrementing? Oh yeah, um, let's let's mute let's mute it. Oh, it's not incrementing anymore. Yeah, that <laughs> is, like, this guy would be we could yeah. add to a platform test. But is it any easy one to guess? That? Yeah, I, I can. I can try to. Uh, I should try to add them. So, yeah, can take an action. So, I think, uh, we'll explore first the simple test in WPT, and then take it forward from there. Okay. Okay, I'll just next slide. The state of the stats. Um, so originally we had the track stats and outbound RTP, and then on the on the receiving side, the remote uh, inbound RTP and then track stats again. Uh, Model around media stream tracks, um, but but they aren't really track. They were never really track stats. It's more like a mix of uh, track encoder, decoder, sender, uh, receiver stats. Mm -hmm. And then we put the RTP related stats in the RTP uh, inbound, the outbound and inbound RTP, but again, this is a mix between encoding and decoding stuff. So we had all this, all this good, but then we have the, so next slide, uh, we, we introduced this uh, yeah, unified plan, transceivers, what happens when you do replace track. Uh, the, the metrics didn't really make sense to, to center around tracks anymore. Um, so at TPAC 2017, we decided to have sender and receiver tracks uh, as that's instead. So next slide, uh, which basically means that the existing metrics we just said these are called sender and, and receivers. That's instead, uh, and if you do replace track, we you know we make a copy of the of the uh, dictionary, but we re reset all the counters. Uh, yeah, so so the sender byte counters keeps increasing, but the the track counters you get a new track stats object, and that's byte counter starts at zero again. So same stats but multiple dictionaries. Um, so yeah, that's that's problem solved, right? Um, so next 
Next slide. Um, problem <coughs> case, no one ever implemented the sender and receiver stats. Like, they're still called track stats in Chrome. Uh, and there's still a mix of, uh, we're still a mix of, of sender and encoder stats or, or decoder stats. Uh, so it's a bit of a mix. And then the, the breaking point from trying to change this again was what about simulcast? Because if you have per encoder stats on the outbound RTP, well, how do you express, um, well, there were, there were problems about how do you express having the same, uh, same track, same sender, but you have multiple, uh, layers so the so next slide this is how things look today we just move things around basically um, so now uh, the outbound rtp is is the encoder and rtp stats that that's, makes sense but in the simulcast case you have multiple outbound rtp objects just one per, per layer uh, even though you only have one sender and then we moved from the send, uh, sender stats we, we moved stuff that was Specific to like the camera, like source source uh, input, like the media track, and we put that in, in, in a media source dictionary. Um, and then on the other, on the inbound side, mess things change. We still move things from receiver to inbound RTP to, to reflect what's going on. But in this case, it's simpler because you you always only have one uh, inbound streams. So you only have one set of decoder stats, and the output of the decoder is the same thing as the, mm -hmm. the track stats. So we put in the media destination track. But then this is the, the state. So this is how things should look in practice. Everything's still put in track stats, but, but the spec allows you to express simulcast and it should be future proof. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move over to issues. Unless someone has questions about all these subjects. Yeah, I think the new model also better supports SVC as well. Yes, and then there will be some issues with that. Right, so, but, <coughs> well, the first issue is, is uh, kind of editorial. We, we made the split and we said the track stats, we need to replace track you. You replace the, create a new track stats object. Uh, um, we never documented the fact that uh, you have uh, track stats on the receiving side as well, because well, you you never change attachments on the receiving side, so it, it's entirely sufficient to just have the receiver track stats. So that will be exactly the same as the track stats. Uh, the proposal on this slide is add to the obsolete section, uh, documenting the fact that you can also have receiver track stats. Because this is what Chrome is shit. We should document what implementations do. Uh, so, is there any objection to that? <coughs> What's the issue? What? Okay. Um, I think they're a bit of a mix. Okay. So, I don't. I don't <laughs> understand the first one. Should track also contain? What does that mean? Um, um, should track. Well, that that was the. I think. Uh, I don't want to go into clicking okay. on the issues on um, this. I have lots of slides. But basically, the proposal here is document that there is uh, such a thing as a receiver track stats. But add it to the obsolete section because there's, there's no useful method to do this. Okay. Right? Are we in agreement? Mm -hmm. Good. Then I'll move to the next slide. Should we have transceiver stats? So I have a proposal at transceiver stats. This would allow us to document the mid in a place that makes sense. It would allow us to uh, expose the direction and current direction, especially the current direction would be useful to have right now. It doesn't exist. We can just infer, are my counters increasing or not? Um, and if we have this, we could also have a reference to codec IDs. Uh, if you do get stats, it, most of the output of this function will just be a set of codec objects uh, because they're less than three transactions. Mm -hmm. So I think we should, I think we should just do that. Um, yeah. So, so you, you can get those information using uh, APIs. You can. You can. You so want to. So we're not exposing anything. So there. I'm, I'm kind of against. Having stats just report what the JavaScript app already knows. Okay. Um, you know, I know we already have things like data channel counters and stuff like that, but 
Here you're literally, yeah. You could do transceiver get steps, you know, mid, and, and space. then space. you could just do transceiver dot mid. I mean, you don't need this. Yeah, you need you need mid because you need to be able to correlate your your stats objects with the the uh, M sections. I like proposal two. Uh, so that would be proposal two. Um, there's also no way to tell which codec stats object belong to which uh, M section. Right, right. Uh, so you could you could but you could you say hey we don't want direction we don't want current direction <coughs> uh, so therefore we put the mid on the center stats object that's that's perfectly valid it <coughs> it's creates a picture from a stats picture uh, right. that's not the same as the underlying model and also when you do get stats. Um, by the time it's an asynchronous operation, so by the time you, you want to expect them and correlate mids and stuff, you know, maybe your API calls will give you a different result. Uh, so I think I think this is preferred since it's um, it's very easy to just report as a snapshot. But proposal two is can't change from other uh, from null to um, that's correct. I guess. Yeah. Um, so then, if you add transceiver stuff, you would have to add transceiver ID and. Uh, yeah. yeah. Everywhere. Right. Right. Um, but if you do proposal two, how do you get things like current direction? You well, don't. You don't, right? But what do you mean? You you can do transceiver dot current direction. Right. So you can't yeah, guarantee you can get it as it is now, but like historically, right. you can't get it from the same snapshot in time. But you can say this is good enough for most. Well, if I call get stats, it's already defined that this has to be the current value. So yeah, no, it's, def it's defined that it has to be the value at the, at the time at of the time timestamp. Time. At the time of the timestamp, yes. Yeah. So I, I'm thinking of like weird scenarios where like if call transfer isn't working or something, and I want to correlate the changes I made in direction to like <coughs> stuff that packets coming in or lost or whatever, I'm just trying to figure out how I would do that. I think this does yeah, help. This, this, if, if you don't have this in stats, you would need to care about um, about weird edge cases, like it would potentially be racy, and our, our stats model wouldn't. You know, so if, if in the future we want to add something else, we wouldn't have a place to put it. Um, What's an example where you care about the current direction? Well, when you're doing things like all transfers, where you're where you're changing direction of stuff, and you know, doing music or whatever. Yeah, right now you have. Uh, RTP stats objects, but you don't know if they're you know, active or not because right. you don't have a direction. You're like, okay, the counter isn't increasing. Is that because the network is bad or is that because it's not being used? So if it says it's active and then you know why it's not moving. Right, then this, this would tell you that. Right. Um, and like, like the implementation effort of adding direction and current direction, I mean, it's, it's no, it's, it doesn't, it's not difference. Well, I, I guess I'm more worried about bloat at this point. <laughs> and I, like the direction, why would you even need direction? Because that's not even negotiated. I mean, current direction, I may understand more, but direction, I don't. Well, it's like the whole, you'd want to trace the sequence. Like when you um, you change direction, then you did the negotiation, then the current direction changed versus, and you know, that's affecting the packet counts and other things. If you so, do for debugging, debug uh, right? Like sometimes I've seen bugs with race conditions where you, know, you negotiate before or after some event in the application. And so it's if, if you see a stat that says, oh, the current direction is this, that makes why I don't do any video, you might ask, well, why don't I do this? Well, <laughs> let's look at direction, like it's direction right. up or not, because, you know, uh, yeah, and you need it to be. You need, that's where it's helpful to have the time, so you know the sequence where all the stuff happened and how it affected the the other stats. So I, don't I think, think there are two. Just just to interject, I think there are two parts to this. First is, do we need a dictionary for this, like the transceiver dictionary, which would carry some information, which includes mm -hmm. mid. I think that that's the main reason. Uh, to to have it, and then the second thing is like once we have the dictionary, like do we need the direction, current direction, or what else? Uh, I think that th these two can be decoupled. I think the first thing is um, transceiver stats make sense because it at least gives one location where you could get uh, a bunch of information that you can use to correlate other data in other stat objects. Um, 
And the simplest one would be like to take the mids, which is the most needed one, and put it in the right place, and then we're fine. But in in the most basic sense, a transceiver is other than the holder of direction, pretty much a correlator between a sender and a receiver, right. which is also what a mid is. Right. So you can yeah. put a mid and sender and receiver, and you're done. I mean, just looking at these two proposals, one one adds one thing in two places, and the other one adds all these other things. So <coughs> Clearly, those other things aren't necessary. Right. Well, right. but if you want to add network preferences or, or, or stuff like that. Right. I mean, there, right. There's, there's things where. There's other things. This is just a natural place to put it. Right. Uh, I, I'd rather have a transceiver stats object that contains nothing but a mid and know that I can place things there in the future than to only have this on the center and receiver. But so the purpose of this of the transceiver stack of transceiver stats object is to debug the STP negotiation. Because the transceiver yeah. transceiver is only defined in terms of the STP negotiation. Right, right. Uh, I'm also not excited that stats for if the only purpose is debugging, there are other ways to debug. Like, you don't have to expose it to web content. It's so. not just debugging. <clears throat> I mean, uh, you know, if you're doing all of these kind of uh, voice things, there might not, it might be something outside of the browser too. You, you just want to understand that having having consistent time uh, for everything. That being said, like I think to, to debug, it, uh, as in like the ship for like not using get stats for debugging has sailed. Like people use it for debugging. We exist because they need it. For debugging, I don't think like saying that uh, this information should not be there. There is no other mechanism today. Like people use get stats, call get stats frequently, infrequently, uh, mainly for debugging. Uh, there is also other purposes to do quality of experience and all that. But a lot of it is to like figure out if things get broken, uh, if if they called something erroneously and something crashed or changed, and nothing like nothing barfed on the JavaScript console. Uh, then basically this is the only way for them to debug. Another point about <coughs> that stuff is it's not mandatory to implement. So there's one question is if your concern is that the bloat is bad for the performance, it like gets that becomes more expensive. And that's one thing. But, but, oh, but then one bar is debuggable and the other is not. Shouldn't men be uh, mandatory to implement? Yeah, it is mandatory. No, yeah, I think uh, we need to distinguish two things. That is, what is mandatory to implement for WebRTC 1.0? And then, how do we see stats being implemented or not over time? I mean, we only get interrupted if all the stats that one browser implements end up being implemented everywhere. So, there is this notion that we experiment with stuff and we decide, we discard, and so on. But I think our end goal is actual interoperability, not just you know do whatever you want. It's just a name, I and mean, that's at least the way I understood what you we were doing with that. So I think the MTI set is very small. I think the MTI set is so small that getting MTI uh, interop is uh, should be uh, low hanging. Yeah. Right. Uh, what I'm saying. Is, Doing the MTI thing is one thing for the first phase of WebRTC stats. At this point. But my I think a lot of the other stats are mainly because of diagnosing. Now the stats are, get, are getting awful. Complex. <laughs> You're breaking up. Issues. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you're falling asleep. Are we on your screen? I just completely flat. Which network are you? You see now we need to be back. <laughs> what Wi-Fi are you on? Which Wi-Fi are you on? Are you still on WCCT back or? WCCT. I'm still there. Yeah, we we lost the last minute.
Okay. Uh, what was the final? Okay. Uh, I think you're back now. It is on the on the on the issue. Oh, okay. Final. Well, well, well. Final. Yeah, so so there is pushback on transceiver stand. Let me just. <laughs> We need stats. You can can hear you. Well, maybe I'll ask you a question in the meantime. When, in your mind, how would I implement? When would get stats current direction ever return something different than a current direction or not current direction? Because am I supposed to cache? Yes, you're allowed to cache. So you could get uh, you could get so the current direction of uh, fifty milliseconds. Ago. Or more, or maybe the implementation. Like that's that's a real work. Like that's the cache time of Chrome. But if you want to go into obscure theoretical things, you could have a. But as far as catching bugs, whether you record the what the current direction was right before or right after this happened, kind of yes. seems a little irrelevant to me. Like probably right. No, I mean I'm I'm, I'm upfront about the thing. The, the main thing I want is the main. Right. And I guess like, it would make I sense like to put them in on the transceiver. Mm -hmm. In fact, right. I think mid should be part of the manager agenda. And I think mid should be a manager. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the main thing is so the main. The question is if I put it on a transceiver object or I put it on the center of receiver stats and let the application correlate them. Um, I mean, the, the whole point of transceiver ID, you're kind of replacing mid with transceiver ID. Mm -hmm. And that's a. Uh, it's a place to put more stats in the future. Yeah. Um, and I think I think direction and current direction are useful, but yes, you can obtain this this information else, elsewhere. Um, so I got kicked out and I'm back again. So I hope the connection. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, what is the final um, pushback, or what is the final decision, or pre-final decision? Um, um, two, I guess. Well, does everyone else like it? Like what? The transceiver, uh, transceiver stats. I'm uh, kind of leaning towards yeah. uh, saying that uh, if, you, if we debug an object, that uh, <laughs> it, if we if we want to use stats for Looking at the transceiver, then we should have stats for a transceiver. Right. I don't think another dictionary is a huge deal. I mean, in terms of bloat, it's probably not the worst defender. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. The bloat is the codex stats. Right. I'm kind of opposed to direction and current direction, frankly, more than the, having a transceiver set so we can move forward. Okay. Can, so can we that. can we <laughs> note note consensus on transceiver object with a mid, but not a consensus on the rest of the members of the dictionary? That's not good. It, that works. Me. So receiver ID, sender ID, and yeah, and yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. And moving on. Yeah, we can start there. Uh, Henrik, we can create another uh, ticket for direction, current direction, so that we can discuss it separately. Yeah. We yeah. kind of don't need sender ID and receiver ID because that is a mid. Like you could use the mid actually to correlate your stats objects. Well, no, no. Never mind. Yeah. Oh, you're right. You're right. 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 So right. Just, 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 Oh, sorry. Uh, what happened there? I'm trying to stop this out and represent. Okay, it'll come back. Um, if you leave, then the form has gone too. So after we moved, after we moved all the interesting counters to the out RTP object. So if you take next slide. Um, there's a there's a slide for for. <coughs> this one, yes. Um, so we moved all the to in, in order to support simulcast and to have our stats model represent, you know, what's actually going on. We moved more or less everything into the RTP stats object, which means we now have a track stats object, which only contains uh, stats members that are 
present elsewhere. They're, they're, they're documented in the obsolete section. So if you were to implement the spec from scratch today, the track stats object would be more or less empty. I have a follow-up slide on what I mean by empty, but it, you don't need it anymore. It's just the point. So, uh, but it still is useful. So on stats end, it has not been implemented yet. But uh, the the good thing about on or one of the good things about on stats end is if the application does replace track, that would end the current track stats object and create a new track stats object. So you would have an event to correlate with replace track. Why is that good? Well, because if you're pulling stats and you're you're trying to figure out what's going on, you have an event that, that you can correlate with with this, right? Like if the resolution changes, then yeah, you'll get a different uh, bitrate, and it's not because your network is bad; it's because you changed the track. So, but it would be very silly to keep um, a stats event around uh, if its only purpose is to fire an empty stats object that doesn't have any purpose on its own. Um, for one, um, and well, the, there's a separate question about whether or not we should remove the track stats object. But assuming it, we remove it, so what do we do about on stats and uh, and and one one thing to do is we don't need on stats ended, uh, or we remove on stats ended, or we remove track stats object. One of the two. In either case. The application can't doesn't have an event to listen to, but we don't need to do anything, arguably, because the application knows if they call the place track, so they they can just know to look at set. Uh, or or even if you don't do anything special, whenever you call get stats, you can tell from the stats if the track on the change. So you wouldn't know the exact point in time when it happened, but you would have a pretty good idea. Like in between this call to get stats and that call to get stats, something changed. Uh, so it's good enough to not have anything special. Um, yeah, I don't think on stats ended was ever anybody's high priority. It, it wasn't on the implementation side. Well, it, it represented, uh, at the time, it represented a uh, compromise between the Chrome and the Firefox models, particularly due to track stats, whether you kept stats around forever or uh, did it this way. I, I'm sold on number one. You don't have to. Say yeah, I don't think you don't have to sell okay. either. So the, the reason it's not boldface when all the other proposals are boldface is because varying is a proponent of, uh, of having a, a, either this event or some other way to find out if the replace track happened. Well, I, I would instinctively say that a replace track already returns a promise and you can use that. Right. So, Varen, are you. Yeah, so so my challenge is that we are not the application. We sit besides the application. And um, our attempts to override peer connection can be very fragile because some other people may override the peer connection. So we have no chance of uh, doing anything except for adding event listeners. And so that's one of the reasons why we like uh, the on, on events, right? So like we have on track, on ice connection state change. It allows us to pull get stats exactly at points when things change within the app. And of course, we pull them. We can choose to pull it more often or less often, and we have algorithms for that. But we really, when the application changes something, um, then we need to be able to measure at those points. And I think the on stats ended was the compromise exactly for that, because it would end a track, and we would uh, fire on stats ended, uh, and we would get all the stats for the track that was just going to be replaced by a new one, right? So we would get everything that we needed, and we would get a new uh, snapshot for the old and the new at the same time. Uh, if so, now with the tracks being almost empty, like removing it means that on stats ended would not fire because there are no tracks that are ending and there are no track dictionaries, so there's not, no reason to fire. And we're now back to the same conundrum uh, as we had in 2016, 17, that now when people call replace stack, we will not have a chance to know what happened. Right. I guess, uh, I guess you could shim replace track. Bit, uh... Yeah, but like shimming replace track means that someone else shims it, and we can be good actors, but they may not be. That means we would assume that we shimmed it, 
and everything works okay but someone shamed it before us and is not a good actor and does not allow us to call replay like listen to replace track and that's the the biggest problem we have like there are so many shims today for peer connection that uh mm. like people add ours and like they put it in some order then someone else uses it like people are not writing web rtcs from scratch they're using some library or uh, platform or such and then it becomes like a big question of how these apis are uh, get overloading uh, like how they overload peer connection i would prefer a model where uh when replace, replace track is called then stats that you are actually gathering show you some state uh like an, an event is uh is uh exactly some, something costly i mean I, I would prefer that the stats would expose that oh replace track is uh, changed and right. you get all the information that you want there to actually debug the fact that right. replace track happened so and, don't we have track ID and stats I don't, know. I don't know. We have tracking and query. In, in so it would change then. Uh, yeah, yeah, you would know. So if you call get stats once every ten seconds, you would know that sometime during the okay. last ten seconds the track changed. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm you want to, often, if you want to know it more often, because you do for some reason, then then you'd have to call get stats. You know, once so every second. The, the idea would be to get the stats just before we raise track is called and just after, right? Uh, I think it's a five and a half time just after, probably. Um, I'm not, not really sure. Warren, what do you think? Like, how often do you... Yeah, actually, like, on stats, on stats ended solved that problem, right? Because on stats ended would give me the track, and I, call, I can call get stats after that thing is called. So at least I have, like, the snapshot of the last state, and then I have a new state, which would be soon after, which I'll call get stats myself. So that's why I like both on stats and we could do that get stats if you wanted to. Um, the issue that I see today is that if you remove tracks completely, there's no on stats ended. Um, so if we don't go with option A, which is to say, well, we'll just deal with it, um, then I think option two uh, is, is nice. So option two is instead of having an on stats ended event, we have an on replace track event. <laughs> Uh, which you know that you might say that that's weird to have an event for an operation that you you cost. That's that's <laughs> weird. Well, we, there's precedence for this. We already have this. It's called on track. No, it's you 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 it's very different. Different. It's very different. Yeah, yeah but it's very remote. <laughs> yeah, 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 very very I don't want to pass the SDP. I don't want to. You know, right, no but I mean, you invoke set remote description yeah, instead of sure. doing. Things when this promise resolves, which you could do, uh, you listen to an event. It's a much more useful event because it contains so a lot more specific information. Yeah. It's very hard to find out otherwise. <laughs> but and in terms of uh, implementation, it's it's a lot less to ask of an implementer to give me an on place right to do an on stats end of event. Because the on stats end of event means we have to keep track of <coughs> a lot of different things and trigger this stats collection. At specific points in time. As an implementer, I'm always okay with uh, not implementing something, especially since we are in a position where we actually want to cut features at risk. Uh, right. So I, I, I don't want to implement on replace at this point. <laughs> and what he's proposing though, is to change one feature that nobody has implemented. Unless you want to make all stats end the feature at risk and remove it. From it is a feature. It is. Yeah. 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 We never implemented it, so it's, we a feature, right. it. it's a feature at extreme risk. Yeah. All, all three proposals are proposal one, though. Right. Except, you know, plus something else. Plus something yeah. else, right. <laughs> well, you could argue so, that all stats end that is useful for, for saving old candidates, but I don't, I don't see the use case for the no. It's just, but that's it. It's it. It could exist for other reasons. I just don't think they're very useful. And it sounds like um, uh, I'm hearing that you know you can shim replace track, but there are <laughs> it's not ideal. Yes. But it still sort of works. And you have a problem that you can do every second. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's not like I mean, so it's uh, fr like I guess then my pushback would be that. Like, then I would want the track stats. Like, then I would just say, like, why wouldn't we keep track stats and not obsolete them? Because then you just carry the double information, and I have whatever I want. 
uh, then like we've already like maybe Firefox has not implemented it, uh, but it is there currently. And my point is like replace track. We've done a lot of analysis on this, and we found that. Uh, it, we're basically forcing our application to poll get stats like at very high frequency to know something that uh, we should have known by default. Like we know when candidates change, we know when ice restart happens, we know so many things uh, because there are triggers that uh, that get uh, exposed. But replace track, we don't know. And there are situations where people move from front camera, back camera. Or do screen sharing, switch screen sharing off to like bring it back on. Um, not at very short time scales, like every five seconds, but reasonably fast that it creates a lot of confusion when people will go and debug. And they just see like, they just want to know something like, hey, if, if my source is changing, you should be able to detect it. And this today, because it's not implemented, is already quite difficult. And we don't have a very good answer for it. And we punted it to the fact that it's not been implemented by anyone. But if you take it out, then basically we're doing a disservice because people are people will demand it. And it's basically saying that, OK, we don't want to do the work. But this is something that I brought up for the last two years from the time that replace track was, impl like, was proposed. I said, this is a gap. We can see it. We notice that people do it. And we already know this is a problem. We're basically ignoring the feedback. We, we have feedback. There is there is a need for for some event, but but if we're being perfectly honest, we, we're not really looking for when the stats objects, and we're looking for when the replace track happens. Uh, so that's why I think as as someone yeah, and, uh, that, as someone who prefers that the has been first option, I, I think the second option is a is a good compromise. So well, so just two questions. One question. On the replace track, we'll be in, we'll be in our CPC, I guess. Yes. Um, I would like to enter in a mode where we say, OK, we have see one is done, and we will do incremental uh, small changes, like maybe on replace track. Uh, it seems that it's important to uh, focus on finishing the, the features that we know are implemented that's not yet fully integrable, and that should be the focus. And on replace track can, can be a proposal um, that we can add as an incremental uh, step later on. I don't. I hope that WebRC 1.0 will not be like, hey, we are done, we're leaving WebRC 1.0 like, like that's dead and, and, and go, go to the beach. Uh, I think we will continue maintaining it, do small changes, and do uh, very small features additions, maybe like on yeah, and to reinforce that, I mean, unless anyone is seriously going to tell me that they're going to implement on replace track in the upcoming months, <laughs> uh, <laughs> then, then I think there is basically no chance of getting that in. on the so From my point of view, uh, uh, implementing on stats ended, I don't think like that's not going to happen. It's, that's not it's too complicated. Right. But uh, implementing on replace track, that will take a day. But actually, if I were to help for this last world. Can you also do it for WebKit and Mozilla? <laughs> so, well, a couple of points, though, just um, to help if someone's going to ask for this in the future. Uh, I'm assuming you would not actually need the on version, because if you're a library, the last thing you want to do is use these on handlers. Because then I might interfere uh, with the application. You add a listener. You add a listener. Exactly. So you don't actually need to define on. Uh, sure. I don't think that I've ever seen that done in, in any other API. So although I, I don't think I've ever seen an event that is not exposed as. Uh, oh no! Actually, that's very common. Uh, what you see is quite unusual in insisting on having on handlers for all their events. Most of. Uh, um, Web specs have moved away, and they only have an element handler now. I think that's what they recommend. Actually, in particular, particular in this case, because this is clearly for a library, yeah, no, absolutely. And no one else would, you know, the application would just need know that replace track happened. Okay. And also, I think stats event might be more general event instead of having. You know, it, it kind of seems quite silly to me to have a replace track event because it's tied directly to the action. Yeah, so, so, so if, if I were to sell it, I would say you need a stats event that's basically 
Now would be a good time to pull for stats because things change. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so that's the proposal three is more generic instances <laughs> of stats events, but you have some <laughs> keynote or something that says this is the interesting thing that happened, uh, which could be something other than replace track, but for the point of this. Uh, uh, so to, to my mind, it seems that we have consensus to remove on stat standard because nobody's implementing it and that's a very powerful argument at this time. And we have uh, a good uh, a good discussion going on whether we should have an should ask for an, an extension to give events when significant things happen. We actually have a line in the spec that says something about what a significant event is because uh, it's the it's the point where you you're not allowed to cache anymore. So every time a state changes, then they are supposed to clear the cache. If you want to have lots of events, you can just tie it to that. Cache clear event. <laughs> so um, I have a question, a time management question. We're getting up to about 2.15 um, and still have a ton more stats to do. Um, uh, I have uh, added another, yet another stat session for tomorrow. At what point do we uh, stop the stats and move on to other agenda items? We're a bit late, late to start uh, after lunch. I think we started at, at half past, so right. we do to 2.30. Well, uh, the only thing is that we have a kind of a hard stop at 4.30 for the okay. external people. So, um, um, well, I, I can, we can uh, finish this session after the next slide, on the way, I guess, because the next one is here. Okay, so why don't we do one more and then we'll uh, move the rest to Friday. Okay. Right. So resolution is, is remove, remove all stats and then, okay. and file a continue discussion. Continue discussion for what to do yeah. instead. Yeah. It, it, it might even be a new version. Uh, and I guess the, the, bug, the new bug will be filed as enhancement or. So, oh. yeah, I mean, a new version in this case. So, the next, so this is the section. Should we move uh, track, sender, and receiver stats objects all to the obsolete section? Um, yeah. Or, so you need, we're talking about correlated. If we have a transceiver object, you can use the transceiver to, to correlate. Uh, Senders and receivers, like that would be your way to do it. So, um, but forget sender and receiver for now. So let's just talk about track stats. It's a copy of something that exists elsewhere. Uh, and this slide is just proving that point about either either it's already moved away, or there exists something similar, or it's something that really should exist somewhere else. If we go through them, uh, media source ID that's already present in outbound case and it's not applicable in the inbound case that I cross it over because we don't need anything for that. Um, track identifier uh, for the outbound case already present in, uh, if you look at the media source, you can test the media source as a track identifier. On the inbound case, that's actually missing, so that, that is something we, we lose, but the proposal is to just add a track identifier on the inbound RTP, it, it already contains all the information about the track you're decoding. So, just add it. Same with the remote source. It's, you can already tell by looking at the direction and the type, outbound RTP or inbound RTP, as if it's remote or not. Uh, ended, that's another one. Um, so this tells you if the track is ended, uh, since media source is the, the media stream track stats object. Clearly, that's where we should have put ended regardless. So we add that. We, we have coverage for that. On the inbound case, on the other, and um, whether the track is ended or not has more to do with whether or not you're negotiating something. So if we want to cover this, well, I would look at transceiver in that current direction, but it was pushed back for that. So, but the worst case is we end, add uh, inbound RTP not ended, and we would say whether or not the RTP stream is, is still alive. Uh, again, it's 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 a metric about the state of the RTP stream, so it should be in the inbound RTP object regardless. Anyway. So, um, current direction is not a replacement for ended. A remote track is ended when it's right. stopped. Right. True. True. Otherwise you could. You right. You could. You could. Um, yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing. 
I think that's what the intention is. Yeah, probably, I don't think you, you, anyone is actually trying to manually end their track of. I just need to stop now. Yes. There, um, can you figure out if they are stopped in place? Not yet. You should. Okay. I mean, that would be the current direction. Right. But again, that's mm -hmm. if we have. Oh, yeah, that's right, because current direction, that's not the. Yeah, so, but but again, like these are yeah. details, I think. Right. Uh, time is already present in both in one and outbound. And the, the only remaining thing, uh, I mean, these things are is priority. Priority refers to uh, a, fe some, a feature at risk of our CPC. Again, I think if we really do want priority, this is an encoding parameter, so we should put that, I mean, there's a follow up discussion about where to put encoding parameter stats. Uh, clearly, it shouldn't be in the track stats dictionary. Uh, so, maybe add it or not. I think the, the proposal, as I mentioned here, are, are that's more like we can figure it out on a PR basis. The point of the slide is more like to say that when we remove everything, this it made obsolete, what we end up with is all of these things, and none of them uh, shout, we need track stats. So, the proposal is. Remove track stats. Any objections? I think it's one. Yeah. <laughs> Remove. You should have opened the slide. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Should we note consensus on yeah. removing track stats? Okay. okay. So, so right. moving them to the obsolete section, and the and the implications will implement obsolete stuff for a while. Um, right, so that was if we want to cut off the, the that session. We are now yeah. would be a, a good time. Okay. Um, so uh, we're now moving to this is uh, discussion of content hints with Harold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, nice. I have, uh, yeah. I'll, uh, basically, what we're going to do here is talk a little bit about degradation preference, which is from over to CTC, because it brings up some of the same issues we're talking about in content hints, and then we'll go into a discussion of content hints. So, uh, back on content hints. And so, the, the way it came about was I uh, get the request for. It's some way to specify that content is not what you expect it to be given a given source. So we had a setup in Meet where you said, "Okay, something is coming in from a from from a, a presentation. That's probably going to need to be sharp. Let's sharpen it up." Or something is coming in from a camera. It's probably a picture, and uh, it, it probably needs to have smooth movement. This worked reasonably well until someone connected a PC via an HDMI cable, which looks to the operating system exactly like a camera, but usually it protects fetches. So the Obvious solution was said was to be able to to me it was the obvious solution was to be able to tell the application let the application tell the browser that this stuff is actually not what you think it is. You should treat it like a spreadsheet or a video. And uh, this got tossed about a bit uh, and and lots of discussions back and forth about attaching it to the encoder, attaching it to the, the track, attaching it to, it to, the, the, to, all the, to the source, attaching it. But the end of that, we couldn't attach it to the source because there's no source object. Some days, I think, uh, that was a mistake. Uh, we couldn't, um, attaching it to the code kind of didn't make sense because a lot of stuff that you would have you wanted to do with these things was outside of the product. And so 
it landed in track. Uh, and Lambda as an attribute, I considered making it a constraint, but that didn't seem to fit too well. And, uh, and so it ended up with a dictionary of values and certain behaviors. And it was very clear that exactly what the behavior was going to be was hard to specify, so we didn't. Uh, I had an interesting conversation yesterday, just reporting on that with a guy who wants to use the content and vocabulary, not the attribute, but the vocabulary, to mark the video tag. Mm -hmm. And might actually use it and want to use it in other contexts for saying, here's a kind of video, here's, and perhaps you should do something about it. This led me to think that uh, this might actually make sense to establish the vocabulary as uh, dictionary values, and then have other specs be able to refer to them. Yes, we're using that vocabulary to describe a video. And then um, the spec is for audio too. And then have uh, this, the other specs try to, to put in rules for saying, here's exactly what you do in order to, in order to make, that, make that work. So that uh, kind of got me started on a dif dif um, different direction, but I haven't looked at the slides since I had that conversation. So that's not reflected here. But I wanted to do that as part of stage setting. OK, um, so uh, this is issue 2248. It was uh, originally posted in one of our TCPC, but somewhat related to this discussion. Um, and it's a discussion of degradation preference. Um, the first thing to note is that in our WD tests, we only uh, set test the ability to set and get the value. So um, we don't actually really test the effect of it. Um, and unlike some other attributes that we have, like max frame rate, it's not that easy to think about how you would actually test the effect. Um, so. Uh, so that's one thing to note is we really, uh, in terms of our testing, we're not really testing that it does anything in particular. The second thing to note is uh, that we've had actually this, um, I guess the only, is it correct to say this has only been implemented in one browser, which is Edge? I think, I think that might be true, current Edge. Uh, but in that browser, it's been implemented widely differently than people were thinking of implementing it in other browsers. Um, so people latch onto this as an equivalent of the continent. <laughs> so they took uh, essentially prefer resolution as an indication that you wanted to make sure that the res the, that the, uh, that it was a, the content was text or something that needed to be sharp, kind of the equivalent of the detail or the text content hint, uh, and took the uh, prefer frame rate one as an equivalent of motion. Um, and uh, mm, the, this was actually, at least as I understand it, very different from what is done in Chrome, which is that uh, there is a very clear distinction, as I understand it, far, between that, that uh, if you were to do degradation preference, that it would only be about basically response to congestion, what you dial back. Yes, or and CPU adaptation. CPU, CPU adaptation has nothing whatsoever to do with content preference. Doesn't, they're totally orthogonal. You can have a, you know, you can have maintained frame rate, um, and then you could have a text comp content preference conceivably, right? So they have they're completely yeah. separate axes. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of an observation on where we are. And the question is, how do we, what do we do about that? Um, and so the first thing is that because I think there's only one implementation, I don't know there's even intent to do more at this point. It's probably a feature at risk. Um, so that's the first thing. So um, Chrome's position is that we want to implement degradation preference. Okay. So you um, the way that it's described in C++ right. level. The problem is uh, currently we default to um, maintain frame rate. Frame rate right. As and so balance. changing the default to balanced is uh, right. pretty key because it will degrade. Uh, 
well, the performance of different applications. So we don't really want to do that. And also the balanced integration mode, which is supposed to be default, needs to be tuned so that we get better results. So, so uh, are you suggesting to change the default to maintain framework? No, okay. not necessarily. Um, balance is probably good as long as it's tuned. Okay. But it's not, well, it's working for us. So that's why it hasn't been done. And we need to get into the transition phase for Chrome to, you know, to expose it properly. So it's a bit of work. We had other uh, priorities right now. It's right. something that we're thinking of doing. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, um, yeah. And the second thing would be to just clarify what uh, Florence said, which is that it really is purely about the resolution framework trade off and not a content hit. Just make that, make that clear. Um, any comments? Uh, I think something called degradation preference should have to do with yeah, like congestion control. What to do? How? What to do when you need to degrade rather than right. what is what type of content is this? So I think we should have. I think there should be a way to control content hit. That should be yeah, it's kind of an orthogonal hit. So much clear what content hit controls. Is so, that prefer a solution? I mean, it, 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 one of the thoughts I had when uh, the, when uh, being through through this was that it would be possible to say, okay, content hint is over here. You get it coming in, and if you see a content hint, you can do the following actions, unless overridden by the user, which would say, for instance, prefer a solution when when detail, prefer frame rate when motion. I mean, have the definition of Definition of content hit over here and have the definition of the actions over here. So the, the actions would be a would be a, an extension to the to the back action spec and the definitions would be useful in other contexts. Well, to mistakes like media recorder could also yes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think I think we've talked about this one. And the next slide is, uh, I guess, your comments on uh, content hints. Yeah. Uh, yes, so there are two issues. The first one, uh, I split them up. Um, the first one is redundancy and lack of normative steps, which is, I think uh, touches on degradation preference as well, is that um, hints uh, don't really specify. They're descriptive of, they're trying to describe what an input is instead of explaining to browsers what they should do with that information. So, um, unfortunately, I feel uh, we feel that unspecified behavior favors the dominant browser implementation, and then everyone else has to re-engineer, uh, reverse engineer that. And it's also a missed opportunity to make that make things normatively testable. Um, for instance, on the this is easier to see on the audio constraints because the, the redundancy is clear there. Uh, the spec mentions echo cancellation, noise suppression, and boost intelligibility of the incoming signal, which I assume is probably auto game control. <clears throat> and so uh, what I like about content hints is that they're a simpler API. I, I love simpler API, uh, so that not only experts can use the web. So um, being able to say track content hit equals music seems like a better API to me, or you know, seems like a simpler API not necessarily better for um, changing the default of whether you know you should have a echo cancellation noise suppression or not a game control. But then it, um, it's also it's a missed opportunity here to make it testable because right now if, if I set music and then I I um, then I log uh, the settings for echo cancellation noise suppression and on a game control, what do I get back? And it's not clear to me. Well, it sounds like it's saying right now that content hint. Um, is uh, does not preclude settings on the object. So the so settings on the object uh, take precedence. Well, so the spec it's actually good. doesn't say that, but it, it's the comment has been that it should. Yeah, I think <laughs> it alludes to that fact that it's this is a secondary thing and it should not override settings. Uh, so um, so presumably, so the example I show here is setting music and then. Uh, it would be nice if we normatively could then expect uh, echo cancellation. Because right now, 
constraints, outsource requirements to the application so that the it's uh, constraints does not a flaw in constraints is that it doesn't say anything about default values at all by de by definition. It lets the browser do whatever it wants within an envelope constrained by the application. So having a way to change the default within that envelope would actually be useful and testable. So uh, for instance, then if you, uh, I think right now actually we've hacked it a little bit in both Chrome, and I think in Firefox we don't, but we've opened the bug to emulate what Chrome does, which is that um, the problem had it is we, we started with like a cancellation, that was the first constraint that we specified. And uh, I think it's in Chrome now, if echo cancellation is false, then Chrome defaults noise cancellation, noise suppression, auto game control also defaults. So they key off the first constraint just because that's the dominant constraint, right? Which is a very hacky way to control the default. So this will actually be a more clean way to control the default. Um, so uh, so this is an appeal to uh, adding more normative steps if we're going to have content hits. And also, I had a question at the bottom of uh, where, where would that go? Mm. And maybe I should just segue in because they kind of discuss the same things. I don't know if they're useful to comment on these individually. Um, but is, issue 30 is about permanence issues. Uh, should we stop or should I just keep going? Or... Well, uh, you want to keep going. Okay, so the other thing that uh, about hints is that they're, they sound like inherent properties of a track, like a music track and a motion track. And you might think they're invariant and ever present because they describe the medium. But they're not. They don't. The first off, they're a control surface, which means that they're a runtime knob. JavaScript can modify them at any time, expecting results. Right. Yet yeah, results are not specified anywhere, nor are there, nor when the observable text may be expected. <clears throat> and they don't follow the media, meaning that uh, uh, the media goes through uh, sync pipes from sinks to sor uh, sources to sinks. I wrote them on my. Uh, pipes like meter connection, element capture stream, web audio, meter recorder, or even track clone, uh, they would basically lose the content hit, as I understand it, uh, which is not necessarily wrong, uh, but it, it's not always intuitive, and that should be made clear, I think. And oh, the last one is that uh, content hits come from the JavaScript application. And someday user agents, maybe in today, may be able to detect what the content is directly by just analyzing it. <laughs> and it's unclear whether these user agents are allowed to ignore the hint from JavaScript if it knows that you know, the browser could say, well, this they're saying this is music, but it sounds like speech to me, so we should do. Right. And this might actually impede browsers from doing, uh, browsers may have incentives to ignore these hints. And that should be clarified, I think. And if they ignore the hint, then what happens to the observable testable effects? That would be fine. If, if we follow the model where you define the hint and then there's the action that is defined in some of the stack, it's each action can say whether you can um, ignore it or not. Basically. Yeah, it still creates the problem for textability because you're sitting there and you're saying, I just changed it. Something's supposed to happen or not, right? right? Yeah, like yeah. So I think that's all my concerns. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing I'm sure is that track the clone should copy the value, but uh, the resulting copy should be modifiable right. because I'll, because otherwise it's uh, we're just weird. Right. And it would, it would definitely be perfectly appropriate for someone to, who was testing this to take take uh, track the capture track the clone change the value display them in two windows and see if you can tell the difference. Right. So so. Uh, after thinking about this for a while, I'm much more sympathetic to normative normative action than, uh, than I was before. 
the first the, yeah. the override thing you know, go, go. if the if the application thinks it knows better than the browser and the, it's wrong well the application has a bug yeah i i i like things to be well defined um, i think if we're shipping feature based on we can sneak this in because it's it's overlaps with an undefined behavior i think we have a problem but i think i think it should be clear um, and if we have an API that is clear that says if you invoke this function, then X, Y, Z happens, then yeah, then X, Y, Z should happen even if the browser is, is able to do something better than X, Y, Z because you were explicitly asking for it. So, I mean, if the browser detects music and the, and the application detects, the application says it's speech, then either the browser is wrong or the application is yeah. wrong. Or, uh, I mean, anyway, that's about it. <laughs> right. Like I, I almost care less which way that goes, other than it has to be specified so that yeah. um, because the application could be Facebook, and then you know, uh, yeah. if Facebook is doing it and only testing it on one browser, then another browser might feel compelled to you know, fix it uh, and not comply with the spec necessarily, or if it needs a better result. Just a takeaway: We should be more specific, specific. <laughs> or, or, or is the well, concrete proposal. I'm, I'm trying to be agnostic about uh, what I think we should do next. I just want to provide uh, this feedback. I think we. I think the. I'm hearing. Consensus between me and Ariva that, that we should raise issues against the spec to specify normative behavior for the case yeah. where, where a company to track lands in a data connection encoder. Yeah, I guess my only question is because uh, content hits applies to multiple specs, right? It affects you know media stream recording, it affects whether it's a CPC, kind of where is that? Do you specify the normative behavior? In those specs and mm -hmm. the content right. inspect. I mean, it, it's, it's clear that the content hint will not be finished by the time we want to declare web like I see easy finished. So right. it's obvious that mm -hmm. to change the behavior there has to be an exception. Yeah. Same for media capture main. So treat content hint as an exception spec that has to specify. Yeah, for much sure okay. yeah. So make make one section in the content hint per spec we want to monkey patch. Are we taking notes on these things actually should be. Are we writing down? Are we writing down the conclusions? Okay. Uh, I suppose it's actually to me. My takeaway of this is that we we're not even sure we have the right model. This content hint the right model or not? We haven't said yes or no. So that's the first question there. Um, we can use. Um, Content hints to say, okay, it's music, so media recorder, please do that. Or we can add an API to media recorder saying uh, this stuff is uh, music. And um, that works fine as well. Uh, so, it, which model is better? Uh, that's the first question we should ask. And you know, try to uh, get consensus. Yeah, if, if control bombs exist elsewhere, then we don't need content hints. But if, if the, the, the idea is that you have content hints that will trigger the knobs variously in different places, right? Across different APIs. Is it, is it the right design or not? I prefer control knobs, generally speaking. But I just take that on a case by case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think so the, one of the, the things. The model we, we seem to be describing in the previous chart was that if there are control knobs, they, sh they must be obeyed. Uh, if there are, if the control knobs say, "Hey browser, do your thing," then the browser can be yet let itself be make bit that can uh, let itself be forced by 
from the central area. If I, if I take the media recorder example, API example, for instance, uh, I could see, for instance, that uh, we, the media recorder will be able to add initialization. Uh, okay, this is music, so I'm doing that. And then if the media stream track content is changing over time, uh, it, might, it might not be able to change its setup. Or, or maybe it could. Uh, it, it, could it might really depend on each, wow. each parameter that you put to media recorder and so on. So that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, defining, uh, Yanni very asked for the delay, in particular, how long it might take. And some of those questions might be codec specific. Like as a weird example, um, we, we added the text content hint uh, in the idea that it might result in turning on uh, content coding tools in certain codecs. But you, you probably don't want to, you probably want to start doing some of those things at a keyframe as opposed to immediately. So it'll, you know, depending on how long it takes for you to get a keyframe and in certain modes, that might take a while, right? And understanding the light might be kind of almost an empirical thing you'd have to study how long it would take. Uh, so taking the example there where we're saying, oh, it's important to get text from the recording, for pay connection, we don't care. We will force the um, web developer to clone the track. Set two content heads two content. and then do these things. If we have a node in the connection, the node in the recorder is um, somehow simpler. Right, so knobs are a good thing, but it's not always a good thing. Like it's some, yeah. some things that a content hit might <laughs> configure is like implementation specific like configurations of the encoder or like how to congestion control algorithm should do this or right. do that. Yeah, okay. and, and so hints, hints, hints are the top where the control knobs are inappropriate because it's it's like tweaking implementation details. And that's okay. when we go with hints. If there if there yeah, if there is like actually specific control knob <coughs> A, B, and C, then you don't need a hint. You can just use A, B, and C. I kind, so kind of agree that then we end up into an issue where it's hints, so it's implementation specific. Yeah. And uh, if it's very crucial for an application, then right. uh, we, we will just fight. Well, yeah. I think specifying it is separate from, like, we can specify it, um, but it can still, I think it should be specified in normative uh, so that they're not, the word hint implies that you don't have to follow it. I think, you know, we have to say whether that's true or not in the spec, to be clear about that. Uh, as far as the redundancy of it, um, I, mean, I guess it's kind of like autofocus, that you have on the knob, so you can, you can also have the default mode. So, um, I mean, Mm. Yeah, I see uh, some appeal in its simplicity. I think I think uh, we don't have to go has to be classified. one one extreme or the other. Like on one extreme, everything is a very specific control knob, and and then that would be a big argument against hints. But but even when when we're in this gray area where we need hints because we're tweaking these things, then of course we should make it as as specified as possible. Right. And if, even if we can say call function A, we, we can still say the intended effects of this API is to do this. Well, here's an example rooting four hints. As I've said a lot of bad things about it. Um, we have three, we have echo cancellation, noise suppression, and auto game control. If we add a fourth one, I don't know what it is, maybe there isn't a fourth one. But if we were to add a fourth one, uh, you know, we might want to have different defaults, whether it's music or or, or speech, and the content and would pick up uh, yeah. that default. So background, background noise removal. Right. If right. we have magic that can remove background noise. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a similar example on the video side. Uh, probably. Could you mention something like games? Could have some different settings. Right. So maybe we move to the next slide, um, which is just a kind of overall question. I saw you pause for effect. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think the conclusion of this discussion seems to be 
seems, seems to be advanced, but we have to do more work on it. Right. I'm, I'm fine with advanced as long as uh, it doesn't seem high priority, and it seems that we we, we have almost done that for our higher priorities. Oh yes. I mean, yeah. uh, we we don't so we don't drop it. We don't icebox it, but. Uh, so I we we will let uh, Icebox would mean that we took a little deliberate decision, decision not to progress. Not oh, to progress okay. 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 I mean, basically, I mean, we're we're using it now, and in particular with the when you go to advanced codecs like an HEVC or an AV1, which have uh, content capture tools, you to make best use of screen sharing, you want to have at least that content in it. You, you want you want to know to say hey turn on this content kind of turn on this specific this profile, specific tool this specific tool yeah. that's what you want right and uh, you know probably in the future though we'll figure out in machine learning how to know what the appropriate thing is but we haven't done that yet so yeah yeah it's useful to have and, um, yeah I, if we agree with this use case uh, I don't know whether that's a solution or not. But, yeah. Okay, so I think we basically answered the questions we set out to pose for this. Is that right? So I think we can uh, move on to other current specifications. So, in particular, uh, we'll start with DSCP, the whole cross priority mess. By the way, time wise, uh, we are moving against the balls. The process should, should, should be at three o'clock, at least. I think there is a slide that says. Yeah, so we're, we're about 15 minutes behind it. Okay, let's wait to go faster. Alan? Yes, Steve. This is a problem that does. Uh, we have got done, done field trials in a while to see what happens if we put up DSCP markings. Results have been pretty consistent. If you just turn it on at a random point in the internet, you get worse results than if you don't. And this is both for consumers and enterprises seeing worse results? I have not seen it broken down. Okay. And we have no current implementation of the API, which it means if it had been part of the main spec, it would have been featured at risk, at least. And so the yeah, idea would be to turn it on and off and customize, like, set up. Uh, well, uh, turn it on and off. Yeah. And but, but the, the, way, the way it, got, it was born was that uh, we had the need to turn, the need to be able to say, I want to run priority in, in queuing without turning on DSCP or the other way around. Right. And we wanted to do this without uh, requiring the ITF to call, call back its spec from the, from the editor's queue. The ITF spec assumes that you're doing both at the same time with the same control. Uh, that's a wrong decision. Uh, anyway. Two, uh, two proposals that uh, I invented. Either we can say that since priority is feature at risk and with no implementation, we should just move it into into this document and say that this is this is how you this is the document that says how you mani manipulate priority. And so uh, we have one document that is all the features at risk, kind of. <laughs> so uh, the, the nice thing about it is that uh, the current DSP document kind of monkey patches around the, how priority works, and uh, and the way, uh, and having having control of both might might actually give some opportunity to simplify the interface. Okay. And the other proposal is, of course, just drop it. Don't say officially declare that uh, we, we don't uh, want anything more. The bad thing about that one is that it, if priority is left in the WebRTC document, it means that the requirement is to set the SAP where priority is set, which means that we're non conformant. <laughs> we're non conformant if, if we do the sensible thing. So, 
my, my favorite at the moment is proposal one, mm -hmm. and which also, and that, that is first all in the discussion about what to do with features at risk. But it seems, seems to me like a, like, like a logical thing to do, and actually get, get some, something useful out of the So would the intent would be to come up, try to use that to actually come up with something that could be implemented? Yeah. Okay. Which is probably not the stuff that you put in there, but something else. Um, uh, somehow, if TSDP is going to be deployed ever, it has to be deployed in a way where you're sensitive to whether or not the local network administrator wants it. Yes. Because the local network administrator, because unless the local network administrator wants it to work, it will work it will make life worse for you. So, proposal one. Yeah. Yeah, I think giving up probably isn't an option. Because <laughs> people keep asking for something like this. I'm curious, from what I know, iOS has some kind of optimization for some communication apps with Cisco routers or something like that. So that's okay. Maybe, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, we need to check. Uh, yeah, the interesting, interesting question is how how it actually the text that is behind it com suitably configures this ground. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's some question I had like related to the SCP API when when the web app is the best one to actually dis decide. Right, right. And this is the uh, yeah, going to be a lot of things there. Yeah. yeah. So if we, and so if we pull it back for more explanation, it kind of gives us. Uh, Gives us uh, the opportunity to see if we can couple it with network information interfaces and so on, yeah. if they exist, to figure out if it's smart to use this or not. Okay. Okay. Proposal one accepted. So now we're moving over to Peter. Um, we're still quite a bit behind on time, but. Gotcha. Um, so maybe. Uh, um, Giving you the, we'll give you the floor, Peter. Okay. And pull it out from under you. Okay. Whenever we. The, the, we the interesting have part is when we get to the BDP mesh stuff. Right. Um, but yeah, I guess this gives context that there are two parts. So we've talked about one is making RTCI's transport uh, standalone in the MV style, and the other is to add a bunch of stuff to make it so that the application can control more things. Um, I'll go to the next slide. And we had consensus on doing the NB stylized transport and on doing generally the mixture controls. Next slide. Um, So uh, we have an editor's draft of this. Yes. Uh, it has some open issues, uh, but has been implemented in Chrome. So it's still sitting there, right? It was, wasn't just the trial, or? Uh, it's, it's behind the flag. Behind no, the flag. It's, uh, it's not from behind the flag. It, it, it escaped because I, I, had, oh. I, I reused it for, uh, I reused it for, for the ice transport <laughs> inside the Oh, you can construct one? Uh, I think the, I think the construct construct is also up behind the flag because I didn't okay. think of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's just nothing. Really you can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, you can just you can just you can do make one. stuff. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Um, so it, it is out there, and I think for the functionality that's in there, it seems to, which is basically just the standalone ice transport with no STP dependency, no forking. You know, you can build stuff on top of it. Uh, uh, although uh, we don't have. You know, the standalone DTLS, so there's not much you could have, but you could have built a quick transport at some point. Right. Well, that's fine. So. Fine and flat, too. Uh, but anyway, for that level of functionality, it does seem to work. Yes. Um, so it's uh, so I guess one question would be can we issue a working group draft for what we've got um, and at least push that out there because it has been implemented, it seems to more or less be okay. Uh, I guess you mean the part that's not flex. Yeah, Actually, flex is still in full of question, I think so. Right. So just for what we have, publish that as a working group draft. 
Uh, and then Peter will talk more about things that so we might would probably run a formal CFC, but is there any objection in principle in the room already? Or? I don't know if it's the right time. And let's suppose and last year, because last year I think we, we had a lot of stuff to do. And they replaced with uh, the progress. So I'm not like last year opposed to it. Um, I don't know if it's the right time or if it's a couple of weeks or months. Uh, because I don't want to delay what we have to do. Uh, and this might distract a little bit. So that's my, my sole concern. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I would comment that. Uh, I think the risk of destruction is fairly small, like it's yeah. one mail sent to the list and then basically it's me and Karen taking care of all the other stuff. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's not going to distract Peter. Peter's not working on work. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sensitive to your argument and mm -hmm. let's get the damn thing done. <laughs> but in terms of actual cost to the rest of the work, I don't think it's very high. So, I wouldn't do it if people object on the, you know, Idea or the principle, but if it's just because of the work, then it's a small piece of that I don't possible. So, she did, like I said. Um, yes, to clarify the thing about Chrome's implementation status, while well, the constructor is shaped regardless, you can construct them. Um, anything useful, like start, a gather, start, attribute, uh, like the the stuff you'd use for a standalone uh, ice transport, those things are still behind the uh, uh, origin child flag. So, okay. Okay. so you can only have a dummy ice transport if you uh -huh. don't have a flag. Well, you can, you can, well, it's you can have an ice yeah. transport where you can read all the values. Yeah, but I, I'm in favor of, of making the spec more mature and removing the flags. So I think. Before we remove, oh, well, I, I don't remove flags, but before flags get removed, <laughs> it would be good to have more momentum across our implementation. Right? Uh, I mean, unless you have want to have to manage lots of the legacy if and when changes come in. Yeah, I mean, we'll get into the discussion of functionality, but basically, this what's been implemented in Chrome is roughly the same functionality as was in Edge, and it's all the same methods anyway. So it's it, there were two, there were essentially two of them of this already. So at least for that for that set of functionality, it's pretty well understood. Peter will talk about other things we might want, which are not in the but. Um, So next slide. Uh, yes, yeah, so this kind of describes what's in Chrome, which is no forking, no flex ice. Uh, and uh, basically, that's the same as what was in OTC in, in the current edge. Um, Next. Um. Yeah, so then uh, there are two possible routes that you could go. Uh, one is to implement things that build on top of that, which I guess gets into the discussion. But even if this working group doesn't do anything on top of it, it is useful for uh, community groups that want to do peer to peer and transports. Um, so it's still useful to be there. Uh, the second avenue that can be um, pursued is to improve it. And so far for FlexSize, we, we had general consensus to do something, but there wasn't uh, any web developer coming and banging the drum or implementing anything, except for the peer-to-peer -peer mesh case, which is why I have a whole bunch of slides for that. So that gets to the interesting part, um, which is what do the peer-to-peer -peer mesh folks need? Uh, it took a long time to figure or to find out what it was. Uh, it took, I mean, I had an action item to find out like over a year ago. So I finally got in contact with the right people and had a lengthy technical discussion with them and they designed a solution of sorts and presented it to them and shared the slides with them and they said yes this would work for us so um, that's what i'm presenting random so yesterday there was someone from baidu working in peer-to-peer -peer cdn i don't know if you had any contact with them and maybe they would be interested and then they were looking for questions on the peer-to-peer -to -peer technology oh, okay yeah, i think this would be helpful for anyone that's trying to do um, peer to peer 
I'm trying to put you in the contact. Sure. Uh, basically, they want to have uh, Peer act like a server in the sense that it can post information such as local candidates somewhere that other people can read and then listen for incoming connections and then scale that to many connections. So just like you would run a normal server if you had a public IP address where you publish your hosting report and then you listen for incoming connections and you don't want to have many, then you want to do that, except they want to do it while they're in a web page behind an app. So this is a little bit like forking, except maybe over a much longer time period and many more responses, or? Forking is one piece of the puzzle. Okay. There are several pieces. And I'm going to try and explain how they all fit together with a little animated diagram here. There's a part that might think it might explode. So watch out and let me know if you notice the part. Okay. So first, uh, the JavaScript application would ask the browser to gather ICE candidates, perhaps with the standalone ICE transport saying gather, maybe with the pair connection. Uh, this is calling set local description. Then the browser gathers the candidates and hands back to the JavaScript application um, the candidates, along with IC frag and password, pretty standard so far. Then the application would post this information along with the DTLS fingerprint, which is necessary, up to some database. So you can think of it like a signaling server, but instead of sending it somewhere that's going to connect back, it puts it there for a long period of time, and then someone can do it later. That's the one important distinction here. Next slide. So some future, some future time, some peer reads that out of, oh, sorry, did you miss a step? Can you go back one? Yes, at the same time, the application tells the browser to retain that candidate. So this is one part of FlexIce to say retain the candidate, which means that the browser will continue to send um, some uh, binding requests up to the, um, the Sun server to keep that NAT hold alive. So uh, at some future time, the peer will pull from the database the fact that the first peer along the left exists, and it'll get its new frag password server flexible candidate, which is kept alive, and the fingerprint. And now it will attempt to connect to the browser um, that is holding that port open with the whole thing in that. So the ice check goes over there. Now, the browser takes the new frag out of the ice check, hashes it, and gives it to the JavaScript application. The JavaScript application takes that hash to frag, hands it to the peer database, and from there, pulls up from some table, um, the other peers along the right, new frag, password, server flexive candidate, and fingerprints. Oh, so this basically, unlike regular ice where the signaling comes in first, the signaling can come in like much later. The check comes in first. Yes. Uh, so then the JavaScript application tells the browser to fork the ICE transport so that it keeps the same local IC frag and password in uh, Canada and tells it to start connecting to the remote the one on the right um, with a new ICE transport that's been forked with a different remote you frag and password, and then of course you do the details fingerprint too. So then ice checks will flow in both directions, and then ice will work. We'll get to type different types of nets in a minute. Um, and then after it works, you can do the details handshake. So if you go back, did anyone notice the part that makes your mind explode? Did your mind explode? Uh, mind exploded when you had uh, Checks coming in before signaling, and somehow could use that. Yes, that's what my mind was. If you go back slide, one, four, one, four, one. When it said when it said hashed, right? Okay. Good. So that's the that's the, the trick. Can you see those terrible advertisements about one cool trick to make your teeth white or whatever? <laughs> this is the one cool trick to make free of meshes work. Okay, so now uh, I'll go on to the other slides and we'll come back to them. And, and this is a, on the peer-to-peer -peer solution that depends on a centralized database? Yes, they, uh, they're already doing effectively this with mobile apps and native apps, and they have a central database that tracks the 
I think it's kind of amusing to have a peer to peer and centralized in the same sentence. Right. Well, you could probably decentralize the, the database. Well, uh, they said they have something where they can put something and pull something out. I said, okay, I'll work on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so the problems with the current connection, the WebRTC stack that does not allow this, is that we currently don't have a way to have local candidates be useful for more than one connection, um, and also for a long period of time. Um, and you have to know the remote you need to bring a password before you can connect. And also, you can't create very many peer connections. Like Chrome has a 250 peer connection limit. Something like 500. Oh, 500, OK. Does they want to create more than 500? Yes, they want a lot. Oh, OK. Uh, thanks, Slug. So um, <laughs> solutions to this are, first, we do ice forking. And you can have uh, more than one connection per the same local candidates. If you have a retained candidate from flex size, you can keep that same candidate alive. On received check is the name of the mind blowing thing that I came up with. I think I might show it, but, uh, and then to avoid the enough peer connection, we could uh, implement the freestanding uh, SCTP transport, ridiculous transport. So we already agreed to do the ice transport. Um, or they could use the freestanding print transport. Okay, next slide. So here's an example of how the ice forking would work. Um, we would create a new ice transport and treat that like an ice server. You gather candidates, and then when you needed to, you would call fork, uh, and that would give you back a client, a, a transport to the other side that you could call start on. So you could have multiple transports. Like I should, I should have said transport instead of client. But anyway, the, the initial thing would never connect to anything. We just treat it like a server that you fork from. Uh, and then retain can local candidates, just like the flex ice that I presented a while ago, um, where once you get a server flex of candidate, you'd say, okay, retain that one. Keep going. Uh, next slide. So this is the, uh, the mind blowing one. Um, basically, you would listen to an event, and uh, the event would have perhaps named hash remote username fragment. Um, and then you would take that thing and send it off to some lookup. And then that would give you back the device parameters that you need to. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a and of course, we already know what the freestanding so objects look like. You're getting a size check, but you can't really. You still have. You still still can't act on it, right? So it's kind of you're getting the event, and it's kind of sitting in a queue. And then when you call start, it it gets processed. Is that kind of the idea? Um, whether Oh, a response can go back. No, well, he, 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 it couldn't historically. You just can't send your own check. No, well, historically, we couldn't even respond because there could be a rule conflict. Oh, well, I mean, as long as you do the lookup fairly quick, it's going to keep sending checks anyway. So right, right. It's slightly delayed, but if you miss, if you drop the first check, it's going to be good. Uh, yeah, so we know what the freestanding objects look like. Either be DTLS plus SCTP or quick. Uh, next slide. This is a full example. This is the whole shebang <laughs> put together that rep that happens in that diagram. So, new ice cream support, treat a thing like a server, um, listen for a server reflexive candidate, retain it, listen for an incoming ice check, get the hash remote using the fragment, use that to do a lookup, fork the ice server, then do a connect to the remote side, and then do a uh, a new DTLS side type to quick here, sorry. Um, DTLS and SCP transport based on the other information that you didn't look at. Um, just as a question, because this is a DHT thing, do they also essentially want data channel and workers to like handle resilient connections they're dealing with? They didn't mention it. They didn't mention it. Okay. I didn't ask, so maybe. And then they mentioned it when we had them on a call or anything like that? Uh, I don't remember. Whether they mentioned workers or not. I don't know. Yeah, do you remember? Okay. We can probably look it up in the slides. Uh, so, one problem with this is that if you if the local side does not send checks to the remote side until the remote it receives a check from the remote side, then this will only work with full cone nets, not um, other kinds of nets. 
And I asked them about this and they said, that's fine. That's how their current mobile native apps work. And that gives them a higher enough percentage of connectivity to keep the full mesh alive. Okay, so here's a big question you might be asking yourself, why is the frag hashed? The answer is, because if it's not, you can abuse it by sticking data in there. And then you have some way to get data from a server to a client that you know is unencrypted and not just controlled and yada yada. You have other things around security and privacy. So one question I had is: so you create a new state with uh, retain ice candidate, and you create a way for a peer to use that state to send some and launch some action. Does that create new risk from uh, either privacy or security perspective? Like can you detect when someone? Gets into a network or detect when someone gets onto a network. I can't think of anything, but that doesn't mean there might be nothing here. I mean, it's, it's possible there's something here. I haven't spent too much time trying to think through. That was really my question. I mean, I guess uh, how much review has been done through that lens? I haven't been. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the forking thing, I think we've thought through, but not in the context of this peer to peer mesh. That might be a whole other thing. So, just uh, I'm curious, what do they actually want to do? Just to sort of paint a picture of the use case a little more. Uh, it sounds like basically they want, whenever one of them comes up, it'll go to the database, look up some random set of peers, and Attempt to connect to them. Like file sharing was one of the big things, right? File sharing, computer file sharing. Uh, one of them is WebTorn. Is what? WebTorn. WebTorn, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first thing you need to do is act like a server, and the second is trying to connect to the other ones that act like a server. But if you only get like half of them, it's still pretty good. And the, the, the database part is agreed as part of a uh, service somehow, or I didn't really uh, go into detail asking them, like, how do you implement that thing? It's just that I was very clear like, this thing is something available that can be used. He said, Yes, it can't be a signaling server that pushes messages out, but it can be a thing where people can put things and then move things out. Uh, what, is, what is the threat model you're thinking of for the hashed two frags? What, is, what are you trying to prevent with the hashing? Uh, basically, you connect um, to a server, and then it sends you. Well, you, you open up your um, your local port, and then you send your candidate to a server. And the server just sends you checks and it puts data in the new frag field, and then you can receive basically raw UDP packets with some kind of training from server. How does the hashing prevent getting the data that like receiving data then? It makes the I mean all you get is hash the data so it makes it useless from that perspective. Right. Uh, it hash you know it's all the eight, 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 eight byte strings and then just compare the hashes, right? So if you're worried about the table, yeah, uh, we could also do throttling. Uh, if you're worried about um, very small amounts of data, like what you're saying, then actually we already have an issue with ice as is. So if you go back to the slide, um, I was concerned enough about this that uh, I thought through it and what's already possible with existing ice implementations, and you can already get some amount of data both from server to client and client to server by jamming data into UFRAG um, or into, uh, where is it, the place that goes? Oh, in the um, address field of a stun binary response. And I put a proof of concept up. So do, are, we, are you saying we've just broken the same origin policy in yet another way in WebRTC? <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> I wasn't sure, so I implemented it to be sure. We did. So uh, why don't we get to the question slide, which I think is next. Yeah, so how hard is this to implement uh, is one question that I had. 
So I went through the different pieces and I thought, okay, the RTC style life transport, that's easy. You know, but, uh, um, the on received check, that's easy. You just add an event, check comes in, hash it. Uh, the the long lived candidates is probably easy. You just uh, keep sending the stun checks. Um, the freestanding DQS and SCTP transport, yeah, it's kind of moderate. It's kind of part of WebRTC, not too bad. But the ice park forking, that's the big question, I think. So, uh, next slide. Um, so, this is like the TLDR for the whole thing. Uh, question number one is are we willing to implement ice forking, which might be hard. Question number two are we willing to implement freestanding objects, which Kind of like uh, we haven't had demand so much for it, but maybe this is the demand. And the third is the uh, on received check in safe, which is what we're discussing a little bit here. Um, and if the answer to all three of these is yes, um, then we're all happy. Or at least the peer to peer people are happy. So I guess, guess not. Question that. number one is it, I think it's true that this uh, DHT is the only thing asking for, maybe games is the only other thing asking for ice forking. Is that right? I haven't heard of the moon asking for ice forking. Okay. But anyways, this is the major one that seems yeah. to want. Yeah. Yeah. I think in games you might want it for like if you want to have a host model like the like a peer the server in a game. I want something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be similar to this, except maybe they wouldn't need the um received check because they right. can't do the signal. What does ice working in pain? Why is it difficult? Have you read the no. ice step? Yeah, so, um, okay. The, the, at least two browsers, or three, share one ice stack, and I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> when I think about refactoring that, it's what ice working in Yeah, so we, we did this in ORTC Live. We did not do it in Edge um, because the use cases kind of. You, you don't need forking really for telephony kind of use cases. Um, and PHTs weren't particularly high in, in that particular uh, browser thing. But RTC, like, there were uh, gaming people and, and who were interested in it. Um, the main complexity there is, is uh, that we decided to have this separate ice gather or object because it was easier to have all the candidates within an object rather than having ice transports well, if you if you separate the candidates into a into a single object, um, and then create transports from it, it makes it a little bit clear what the state of the individual candidates is. Because remember, in an ice transport, you have candidates getting pruned, so you can have multiple ice transports kind of based on the same gatherer, but their candidates pair state is very different between them, and yet the, the gatherer has has all of the candidates. So it just was logically easier to do it that way. Um, and I would say the, the complexity came out of realizing that there were other things that needed to support forking as well. Like initially, we didn't do uh, support forking in DTLS transport. And we realized, oh, we've got to pass the certificate in there because every, but every DTLS transport, when you fork, it will all be started from the same cert. And then that's what generated the whole idea of, uh, particularly if you wanted to put them on different threads, you had to have a post positioning where you started moving you know, being able to give the certificate to each of these things we were going to create. So anyway, that was, um, so it took a lot of rework to figure all that stuff out. Uh, um, and in addition, there were um, additional ICE optimizations you probably wanted to do that I think are relevant, um, equivalent of things like continuous nomination or renomination or, or all of that stuff. Um, I don't know whether the, I don't think the ICE gatherer really was that helpful in those things because those were mostly like ice transfer things, not gathering things. Uh, but the other thing is um, it, we, it was helpful to have an ice gatherer if you wanted to have a lot of control about what candidates were gathered. Um, so like, uh, you know, sometimes people would only want to gather IPv6 or, you know, from certain interfaces and stuff like that. Um, so I wouldn't say overall, um, it, it wasn't enormous, it, it was, it, we had to do a lot of rewriting of code, but that was because we didn't understand it when we started out. I don't know if it would be that complex if you start from scratch and knew exactly what you wanted to do. Uh, but that's part of it is is being clear about about exactly what features you want. So, at least for some browsers, 
using with WebRTC. If somebody went and implemented it into WebRTC, that would be most of the work done. I don't know who that would do that. But uh, what about Firefox? How's the ice stack on Firefox? Okay. So based on what last year? I'd have to check with him. Okay. Yeah, he's Mr. Ice. Mr. Ice. <laughs> so uh, are you saying you wouldn't implement it in New World uh, I was just trying yeah. to say that <laughs> there are two people that would need to Right. <laughs> or there are two code bases where this would need to happen. So there so these are at least one likely implementation coming. I, I have no idea. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess uh, we have to answer the question of how important we think the use case is. Use case is. Use case is. Yeah. Use case is. So we go. Ice pain. Use <laughs> mesh people. Okay. I'll say I detect enormous amounts of enthusiasm, at least not from within this group. Well, I mean, I it that. doesn't seem to seem to be something that requires this group to agree to doing it. Yeah, it would be probably more persuasive if a bigger industry like gaming were cared about it as opposed to uh, you know just peer to peer. Right, and as some appeal from a distributed sense. Yeah, right. I mean, what that could be pushing. It could be so, <laughs> <laughs> where they are and how to sell the story. I can ask the else what you think. Okay. So <clears throat> then, yeah, more use cases for help. Yeah, I think my sense of the room is that this sounds appealing from an engineering perspective and does enable interesting use cases, but getting maybe more momentum behind the use cases might motivate uh, decisions. Well, the um, the DHT people have uh, posted a bunch of, uh, I mean, at least one issue on WebRTC and the use cases. I don't know if any of those people are here, uh, but uh, we certainly invite them again. We should, we we should certainly let them. I'll let them that's uh, uh, needed. Oh, is Leonard the person who's? He's one. Oh, okay. <laughs> you just certainly get that that uh, issue merge. Is yeah. Well, they 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 uh, didn't. They never did a. They filed an issue, but they never filed a PR. Yeah. So. Well, they have to write up a PR for. Right. They have to write up a PR. Okay. Uh, it's three twenty-three. Yeah. So we were originally going to have a break until three thirty. Um, that's not true. That's it's. This yeah. will be a quickie break. Um, what should we do with the next hour? Is uh, Yanni is kind of important because yeah. teachers at risk. Yeah. Um, how about how about this? Can we come back at three forty-five? So a short break. Mm -hmm. so you want a longer break? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I need one, but I'll make do with it. Okay, we'll torture you now. Three forty-five. Three forty-five. Three forty-five. Coffee round. Coffee round. Coffee, I'll come.